Well, I, I want to say good morning to each of you today and happy July 4th um, week. It's been a great week and I think the last couple of days is, are really reasons why we live in northeast Indiana. And in I mean, just incredible, incredible couple of days, humid a little earlier in the week, but uh, praise God for just a, a great opportunity to be with family and um, to enjoy the weather and be outside and and um, enjoy the festivities of this time of year. It's been awesome. And it's great to have each of you here today. I mentioned to you last week that uh, the 4th of July was a little different for us this year. Um, our kids actually got together and rendezvoused up in Alaska. They all got together there. And then uh, my wife and I were here. And so we were here, they were there. And you always wonder as parents how it's going to go. And um, I mentioned to you last week how I, I follow Alaska uh, Dispatch News. Uh, because I, I kind of like to know what's going on in that area of the world, just so if I can see if we'll stand out of trouble and whatnot. And um, and I kept waiting, you know, for the thing to come through. You know, former Indiana residents shoot each other or something like that. And you know what? It never happened. And it's like this is awesome because I think we're actually going to be able to pull this off, and nobody's going to get harmed or maimed while while they're there together. And, you know, it worked out pretty good. Uh, they, they survived. We got Levi home Thursday evening. I think Megan and her husband uh, were able to get home. Um, I think their plane was delayed, but they were to get home uh, by midnight last night. So that's good. And so I hope that all of you and your family uh, have been able to go and see and do and then reassemble and come together once more and uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. May God bless you in that. Summer is just a wonderful time. Uh, like I said, the weather's awesome. Uh, and uh, um, just the, uh, the corn, maybe some of you have had some ears of corn. Man, that's awesome. Uh, the corn is in this time of year, and the crops are, are growing well, and we're glad for that. And uh, Indiana has a beauty to it, all its own. And so just enjoy this time of year. Getting lost on those country roads as the corn gets taller and taller and you're kind of nestled in there. Just enjoy everything about being in Indiana and being alive. And at this time of year, it's a good, it's a good time. Today, um, I want to do a couple things with you. Uh, I want, we want to look at a couple of uh, passages of Scripture. And I've, I've been talking to you on the theme of my Mayberry, making things better where you live. And uh, this was not just a, um, a, an idea, this is not just an idea of mine, but it's a very biblical idea. And Paul had a, as a big vision in his life to make a difference in the communities in which the churches were located. And so we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my Mayberry, making things better where you live. And we're going to look at a leader's vision today, a leader's vision. We've, we've talked a lot about in this series of, uh, a leader's core, a leader's credibility, a leader's impact, a leader's heart. And today we talk about a leader's vision. And a vision is a, is a, a, a mental image of a preferable future. And it's envisioning that. And it's important for us to have vision. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I want to talk to you also... Uh, uh, just about what it means to have an identity in the gospel. And this is going to be based on a couple of the passages that we're going to look at together, uh, which are very intriguing passages, very powerful in the book of Titus. And really our whole church vision statement is built on the passages that we're going to look at today. And if you came in today and you got a bulletin, you're going to see a vision statement that's at the bottom of the bulletin. Uh, that's our vision statement. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that today. And then uh, the Connect, Grow, Serve is kind of the process of we want you to connect. We'd like people to connect in some way, either here on a Sunday morning or um, in maybe something that's happening in the community or maybe a small group in other ways. Uh, to grow once you make the connection, to grow with others, and then finally to issue forth in a life of service. And so that's kind of the process. And then if you look on the back, what are some of the core values? And you see a little, you'll see a little graphic at the top of the back, uh, back page of the bulletin. And uh, these are some of the things that we kind of commit ourselves to, purposes and core values that we commit ourselves to to ensure that we'll accomplish the vision, right? And so we'll touch on some of these today. I've got those listed in your version notes in your, uh, on your smartphones, and so you can reference those. Uh, and then uh, I might even might even let let us have an insight uh, via Andy Griffith and Barney and the, and the crew might even take some time to take a uh, to have a bit of insight on this 
and how to live with grace. Uh, it's so important that we emphasize that and, and we'll see that in our passages today, the grace of God. And we'll see uh, the graciousness not only of Jesus, but the graciousness of a leader. And it's very important that leaders be gracious and that we lead with grace. And Andy does a great job of that, Andy Griffith Show. We might just take a moment to look at that. Uh, and then maybe as, as the Lord leads, uh, we'll wrap it up with, well, we could call it a July 4th kind of theme story uh, from a, a, a guy by the name of Edgar Harrell who actually uh, survived the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, which, by the way, there is a memorial in the city of Indianapolis dedicated to that event. A uh, very incredible story uh, of survival. And when we talk about a vision, we talk about salvation, we talk about rescue. And uh, it's very, very clear that we cannot save ourselves. We need rescued. And sometimes we have good illustrations of that in real life. But God must do the saving. And that's what really drives everything. Okay? It's why we meet. We understand that and we keep that vision alive. Um, let's, let's take a second to look at two passages in Titus. Uh, we'll look at the first passage. We'll, we'll do it in, re- in reverse order. They're going to be from Titus 2 and Titus 3. So we'll look at Titus 3 first. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. It's an incredible passage of life, of salvation, of rescue, of renewal, of a new beginning. And so essentially what Paul says here, and he's going to say it again in Titus 2, he's he's going to share with these guys what the gospel is. And the gospel is an announcement of what God has already done for the world in and through Jesus. You have been saved, you've been rescued, you've been redeemed, you've been washed, you've been uh, rebirthed, you've been renewed, you've been justified, you're now an heir of the hope of eternal life, praise God, you have a brand new gospel-oriented identity, and now I want you to live in light of this identity. And I want you to believe it, and live in light of it. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And it's part of our vision, okay? And so, we see that. Now, let's go to the next passage, uh, Titus chapter 2. All right, and we once again we have these four or five incredible verses. Now, let me tell you something that all the commentators are looking at. When you look at these two passages in in Greek, all right, which is the language of the New Testament, here's what's crazy, and the commentators talk about this. It's all one single sentence. Okay, one single sentence, what I just read to you in, in Titus 3, what I'm going to read to you here in Titus 2, and I just checked my Greek New Testament book before I came out just moments ago. There, it's all one single sentence. The translation breaks it up into a grammatically acceptable way of saying it. But it's all one big sentence. Why does he do it that way? Why does he run things on together? Why does it make all the grammarians cringe when they read some of the things that Paul writes? Because he's doing something, they all agree, not all of them, many of them would agree and they would assert that what Paul is, he's quoting something when he runs them together like that. And when he runs these ideas together, again, we don't see it in English because it's nice and tidy in the translation, but what he's doing is he's quoting a very ancient system of belief, a very ancient set of of, uh, accepted teachings regarding Jesus, his life, God's mercy and grace and what he's done for the world in and through Jesus, okay? And so uh, he's presenting to us something very ancient. And so many times, many times, you'll notice in Paul's letter that he describes for you what God has done for you. And he does that first, and then he'll transition in the book, the book of Romans, the ideal example of this. He'll give you theology, then he'll transition and he'll give you application. Since this is what God has done for you, this is therefore how he would have you to live to honor him 
and, and, and honor a salvation that's already been accomplished, the rescue that's already been achieved, to go ahead and now and live in light of that rescue. Okay? And so what, what, the reason he does that is he wants you to understand that you're not acceptable to God because of some moral code that you've decided to live your life by. You're not acceptable to God because of of your goodness and your righteousness. The reason He shows you first what God has done for you is so that you would understand it's all about grace. It's all about His mercy. It's all about the gospel. And so, uh, when we see these passages like this and these large, many multiverse sentences, there's something very intricate, long Greek sentences or something that's happening. And so what we see happening is that they are in fact summaries of the Christian faith. Okay, they're summaries of the Christian faith. Notice not what, what is not in these passages. It's lifestyle, it's how you're going to dress, whether you're going to smoke or not, whether you're going to go to movies or not, whether you're going to do drugs or not. Okay, it doesn't focus on those kinds of lifestyle issues. It focuses on the essentials of the gospel. This is how we're saved. This is how we're delivered. This is our new identity. And here's what Paul's point is. His point is, if he can convince you of who you are in Christ and remind you of that over and over and over again and eventually get you believing that, he won't have to tell you how to live. He won't have to give you a moral code. You'll figure that out on your own with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You'll figure that out if you will but accept your new identity. Your new, the newness of who God says you are. Okay, so the gospel, as a review, the gospel is an announcement of what God has done for the world in and through Jesus. You have been saved. You've been rescued. You've been delivered. Now we are called in the gospel to believe and live in light of it. And so the gospel, these passages are, it's Paul speaking a new identity over you and showing you a love that's always been yours, but you wouldn't accept it. It's a love that's always been yours. And that's why Paul and Titus typically don't start their discipleship with instructions and commands because people might mistakenly think that God loves us because of of what we have done or how good we are. And so that's not the gospel. The gospel is an announcement of who God insists that you are and if you will keep telling people who they are who their best selves are if you keep reminding them of their true identity. If you keep reminding them of who they are in Christ, there's a good chance they'll figure out how to live that new life. And so when we read things like, for the grace of God, it's His grace. We're not deserving of this. Okay? It's the grace of God. God doing good things for people who have even opposed Him. Think about how gracious that is. Someone who has been mean to you. Someone who has been unacceptable in how they treated you. Maybe over the July 4th holiday. Somebody wasn't nice and they they spilled the potato salad and never cleaned it up. And they ate all the brownies, okay? And they drank all the punch and, and they just have been obnoxious in what they say and the trouble they cause. And then all of a sudden, it comes dessert time and you're actually, you actually serve them a dessert on a saucer. Because you just wanted to. Because you're going to treat them nice no matter how belligerent they're being, how disruptive they are in a family get-togethers. Okay? That's grace. And that's God. That's what He does. Okay? Grace is not just doing something good for somebody. It's doing something good for somebody that's opposed you. That's made life difficult for you. We're going to see Andy in just a little bit. He's going to live graciously. I'm always about the practical, right? So we're going we're gonna to look at the practical and Andy's going to show you how to live graciously, how to lead graciously like that. Even when people oppose or people make life needless, needlessly difficult, right? It teaches us, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. God loves us as we, as we lose our way and he draws us back. And, but it teaches us over time to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. If we don't live for the love of God, the grace of God, the life of God, we're going to live for something, okay? Something's going to be our guide, and it's going to be a worldly passion, and it's going to create a lot of havoc in your life. And life teaches us this. God teaches us this. To live self-controlled, 
negatively to say no to some things, positively to self to live self-controlled, that's inward stuff. Upright, that's outward stuff with people. Godly lives, that's upward stuff with God. Okay? It teaches us that we look at our lives in light of who God says I am and I begin to live for Him as a result of something He's already done for me. I didn't earn it. He already did it for me. I'm going to in light, live in light of this new identity. And it presupposes in this present age, end of verse 12, it presupposes there's another age on the way. Another age is coming. And so we're going to orient our lives now in preparation for the coming age. And part of that is deriving an identity from Jesus, from what he's done for us, to accept our save, uh, to accept what he's done for us, the savior of the world, our redemption he's accomplished, accept that while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and savior, Jesus Christ. Notice how he says God and savior, Jesus Christ. Christ, God and Savior, the deity of Jesus, very, very simply stated here. Uh, but it's not to be passed over lightly. He is both God and Savior who gave himself, grace cost, is very costly, he gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Grace is all about a person who gave. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. It's a term of uh, to buy back, to buy us back, okay, from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good, eager to live out of this new identity, this Jesus Christ identity, this grace of God identity, this identity that says, you know, I'm, I'm here, I've been blood-bought, I've been rescued, I've been redeemed, I've been saved, and I want to live my life, as a, let my life be lived in such a way it's a reflection of that. Now, I know you're smart people this morning. I know you are. You're Hoosiers. You're not going to say no to a great opportunity like that. You're smart. You are edumacated or educated, right? You're edumacated Hoosiers. You're, you're, you're snapped in. You're ready to go. You're on. You're, you're, you're with this. This has credibility and it rings and resonates with you, right? Think about how silly it is when God does something so great for you and for me and for the world. He's done something so great in and through Christ. A brand new age has been inaugurated, brand new. Life is different now. Think about, think about how silly it would be to reject such an incredible offer. Think about you're kidnapped, right? You've seen the movies where, where there's hostages and you're in a hostage, hostile situation and they're threatening to kill the hostages unless their demands are met. And all of a sudden, the SWAT team, well-trained, they come blowing into that place. They have a plan. They've executed the plan perfectly. They're saving lives. Everybody's hunkered down in the floor in the corner. But when the SWAT team arrives, they run in there and they, and they, and they take charge of the situation and they confront the perpetrators of, uh, of the criminals and perpetrators of evil, all right, who are going to start killing people unless their demands are met. But instead of getting up and running out, you stay in the corner. Well, Joey, why are, well, I think I'm going to stay. I think I want to stay here in my corner. I like my corner, right? I like where I am, and, and I think I'm just, I think I'm going to pass on the rescue operation. <laughs> you, y'all go on out, enjoy your chicken salad and ice cream and, and all the things you're going to do. I'm just going to stay. I don't want to be rescued. That's how silly it is. Think about how silly that would be to say no to God's rescue operation. I'm a hostage to sin. I'm a slave to it. I'm a passion of evil. You know, really? I mean, our sin nature has kind of infected us. We're rebels against God. When we say no to God's rescue plan, it's about as silly as that. It's like, it's like you're treading water. Another illustration. You're treading water in the ocean. You're treading, you're treading day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. You're just treading water, trying to grab onto whatever a flotilla device of some sort. All right? Maybe it's a crate. Maybe it's a barrel. Maybe it's a life jacket. Kind of what our guy does today in our closing story. And finally, the plane sees you, and they dip the wing, and they let you know, and the ships come, and everybody's getting on board, and they look down at you and say, Joey, okay, let's go. 
You've been rescued. He's like, ah, I think I'm going to tread water a little bit more. I'm just, now nah, I'm enjoying it out here. Night, the, the darkness is really dark at night and the light pollution is not out here on the ocean. I can just look at the stars and it's kind of fun to see the dorsal fins going around me, you know, and doing circles. Ah, I think I'm, yeah, I'm going to, I'm enjoying this. Think about how silly that would be. Think about how crazy that is. And that's exactly what's happening in our world. Is that many, many people, they've been rescued. They've been redeemed. Great, God has done something great. Delivering them from that meaningless treading of water. Delivering them from that, the, 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 uh, the God of this age, Jesus says. This, there's one in the world that works to pull us away from all that God intended for our lives. To cloud our vision of what it means to be forgiven. To lead people to God's forgiveness. To, 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 to dis, uh, disorient, to confuse us about that message. To restore us to all that God created them to be. To, to, to mess up what God, what the beauty, the beautiful things that God wants to do through our lives. And that's how crazy it is. And Paul couldn't conceive of a world that when they see and hear this incredible message of the gospel and the grace of God and what he's done for the world, he couldn't conceive of a world of anybody who would stay in the water treading water who would stay in the hostage situation and not get up and leave after they've been uh, liberated. And yet many people choose to do that life that way. And Paul says, that's not your story. You have a better story than that. And you've been identified by something. And now I want you to live in light of that something. You know, uh, as I think about this, I think about something that happened somewhat recently. And... uh, uh, how many of you, like, if I said the name uh, Harry and Megan, does that ring a bell remotely with anybody? Anybody? Megan and Harry. All right, what if I said Megan Markle and Harry? Would that ring a bell to anybody? Okay, so, like, nobody, nobody knows who I'm talking about. I, okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, that's, that helps me, all right? And so, I didn't actually watch it live, but I understand, like, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I have a feeling that's a lot of people here that probably have watched it either live or they watched it after the fact. And it's kind of interesting because when I think about our identity, I think about living in light of an identity, I think about reminding people of their identity, I think about when you understand your identity and who God says you already are before you're ever there, He says what you already are, and when you choose to live in light of that, I don't have to tell you how to live, you're going to know it. You'll figure it out. Spirit will guide you, the Word will guide you, coming to church will help you, okay? I don't have to, I don't have to major on that stuff because you're going to know it because you have this new identity that you got in mind who God says you are. Well, thinking about Meghan Markle and her life and her new identity, when she married Prince Harry, when she said, I do, she said, I do, to a lifetime of British royal formalities and unspoken rules. And and, uh, her vision, her identity of being royalty translates into everyday lifestyle. It goes something like this. I just kind of did a quick Google Google search on this. She will be observed continuously as a, 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 a new bride, a new member of the royal family. She will be observed. She will become a very public person. Every aspect of her life will be scrutinized, talked about, photographed. No single glance or gesture will go unnoticed. People may make a big deal out of nothing, and that's the way uh, bored, uh, news-starved people do, right? They make a big deal out of just a slight gesture of some sort and try to build a whole story on that. She will become, she will be observed continuously in her new status, her new identity. She will be set apart socially. She deleted all of her social media accounts after her engagement. And she no longer can take selfies with adoring fans. Why? Because she's royalty. Okay? Uh, Only certain pictures are allowable and they must be modest. Okay? Number three, she'll dress conservatively. An unspoken dress code will now dictate her fashion picks. And and it's unlikely that she'll ever bring out those ripped jeans or... or, uh, uh, 
the plunging neckline of a sparkly mini dress. It's not becoming to royalty. And so that'll, that'll impact her life, how she dresses. Her identity impacts how she presents herself. She's just not anybody you can take a selfie of and put out there on social media. No, no, no. The, we don't handle royalty that way here in Britain. Okay? She will change vocations. No more acting. As a royal, she'll have more time. and She'll focus on some of the philanthropy and, and charity causes she already uh, supported before she met Harry. But then she'll continue these. And, and she'll uh, uh, join in with the royal foundation. And, and she'll join William and Kate. Uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, and, and she'll join the, their, uh, their family in, in, in these uh, um, f- uh, causes of philanthropy around the world. She will represent the Queen. Meghan will, will join Harry as he travels the world on royal engagements on behalf of the 92-year-old grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II. Okay? And uh, as the Queen continues to get older, especially since... Prince Philip has retired from public life. Harry and Meghan are going to be very busy with these royal engagements and in demand in terms of charity events and Commonwealth tours. In the past, Meghan had not publicly announced her loyalty to a certain religion, but that changed in March when she became a member of the Church of England in a secret ceremony of the Royal Chapel at St. James Place in London, the head of the royal wedding. Meghan Markle will become a British citizen now. And it takes five years to accomplish that, but she's already treated like one. Uh, Along with the public, whole public image thing, there's a major ban on any sort of PDA, public demonstrations of affection. Even if you're married, you're very discreet about how you do that in a public setting if you're you're royalty. The royal family remains neutral and mostly silent when it comes to politics. Uh, She's had to back off of endorsing former uh, political candidates as well as uh, uh, restraining and and restricting comments that she has to offer uh, regarding politicians who are currently serving in a political office and she can't run for an office when the royal family attends events there's an order of precedence and so Harry and Meghan will most likely enter fourth right behind William and Kate and she must always travel with a black outfit Because if someone dies in the royal family and she has to return unexpectedly to England, she has to be prepared to be seen in public as one who is grieving that. And so she always has to travel with a black outfit. You see how her identity of royalty changes everything about her life? You see that? How did Paul express it? In Titus 2. How did Paul express this? In Titus 3. We're observed. We're observed. Eager to do what is good. Verse 14. We're set apart. To purify himself. A people. A people. We're modest. We say no to worldly passions. We're representing Him. We live a self-controlled life. We're citizens of another country. Godly lives in this present age, the text says. We're loyal to a true King. We wait for a blessed hope. We're heirs in a royal family. We're washing uh, the washing of rebirth and heirs of eternal life. We're living for different reasons. It's grace and the mercy of God. You see what Paul is doing. You see he's trying to convince you of who you are, who you've been saved by, what that means, and therefore it translates into a whole new identity, a whole new lifestyle. Just like You used to be a commoner. You're royalty now. You're an inheritance. You're in line to receive an inheritance through what Christ has done. And if you'll say yes, if you'll receive this new identity, I don't have to tell you how to live. I don't have to tell you what to wear. I don't have to tell you what to do. I don't have to tell you what lifestyle issue to to where where to stand on those things. You're going to figure that out. If you'll reflect on the new identity to which you've been called, it'll happen. And that's part of the vision of Stone Hill Community Church. That's why you like coming here. Because I don't stand up here and scream at you about those things. 
and yell at you about those things and major on those things. My job, my vision is to remind you of who you are and what God has done for you in Jesus. And by the way, this morning, if you have not personally received this, every week, I would want you to know it's always the right time, not just here, but wherever you are. When you understand that you've been called into something new like this, something a rescue, a redeemed status, a new identity status, it's always right to say, Lord, I personally receive it. And that's called being born again. That's called justification. That's called lots of adoption. A lot of wonderful ideas in the Bible about that. But it's always the right time. And so I, I, I want to convince you this morning you're not a commoner anymore. Your royalty. You're being observed. You're being watched. Your life is, it, people are taking note. There are certain things that happen that will flow from this new life. And the Lord will guide you in those things. And so when we think about, when we think about our church vision, okay, and uh, we think about what we see on the front of our bulletins every week to lead people to God's forgiveness and see them restored to all that God created them to be, to lead them, don't manipulate, don't coerce, not to guilt people, not to threaten them, beat them, flog them, embarrass them. Aren't you glad we don't flog people? Man, that's a, that's a relief. I'm glad when I took the job, they said, you know what, you don't have to flog people. You don't have to take them out and strap them up and flog them if they don't toe the line, right? Or hit the mark. We don't manipulate. We don't drive them like cattle. We don't manipulate them like salesmen. We don't deceive them like a cult leader. I was going to say a politician, but that's not good. Like a cult leader, all right? We don't force them and guilt them and scare them. We gently lead. We invite. We woo. We, we present an argument for truth, the gospel, we make a great grand proposal that there's a better way to live life, but we understand that we all need forgiven to lead people on your, on your bulletin, in your version notes, okay? To lead people to God's forgiveness. It's been, we've kind of forged that and, and, and hammered that out several years ago. It's still part of the vision. I'm explaining why, uh, a little bit of the philosophy behind that vision this morning, to lead people to God's forgiveness, okay? We, we, have, we have betrayed people that maybe we vowed to love. We have, every one of us needs to be forgiven for something. We, we maybe invested our life in the wrong things and, and, and maybe we have addictions, that, uh, we've dabbled in addictions and, and all the energy, energy that went to feed that addiction has robbed us, uh, robbed us of, of better marriages, robbed us of, of maybe the parental calling that we've been called uh, to, to parent and love our family. We're not loving them as, uh, like we should because we've dabbled in, in addictions and things and gotten bogged down with that. Maybe we've shown a bad attitude towards somebody. And maybe we've been really immature in how we've, we've responded to people in our life. And now we're beginning to see it and we need forgiveness and everybody needs forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiven for something. And like I said, you notice that I don't scream at you about that up from up here. And I, I want to propose a better idea I want to propose a clear view of truth. I'm proposing an intensely, intensely practical way for us to think about the spiritual life and about truth and why we do what we do. And the hope is that we can create an environment that removes unnecessary distractions so you're free to enjoy a God moment, so you're free that God can show up in your life in such a way that you're moved to a place where you're ready to personally receive what He's already done for you in and through Christ that you can receive this forgiveness, this new status of forgiven. God's forgiveness to lead people, not manipulate them, to God's forgiveness, okay? God's forgiveness. We all need to be forgiven because of what Christ has done. He is our new identity now. And to say this another way, and per uh, four or five messages ago, our vision is to give people a brand new letter to wear. Instead of a pinning ritual where we pin these letters, these invisible letters as, as we talked about uh, four or five weeks ago. There's a baptism ritual that ends all ritual assigning processes. No more letter assigning rituals in our life. 
Some of you know that I'm talking about Jamie Ivey. She talked about her, the, the book, The Scarlet Letter, and, and how that in that letter, or in that novel by Hawthorne, incredible novel, Hester Prynne, who is caught in adultery, and she's forced to pin the letter A to her chest every day, and it stands for adulterer. The story is set in 17th century Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony, 1642-1649 is the time period. And the community had branded her this way so that everyone would always know what she had done and she can never escape her past. And Ivy says, I've always felt as though I understood this fictional woman because of the seasons in my life when I've imagined a similar letter pinned to my chest and I often felt as though the only thing people would ever see in me if they only knew would be the letters I knew were invisibly attached there. Not until years later, she said, did I begin to realize that the only one obsessively focused in all these letters and on all these letters was me. And this subconscious pinning ritual I went through every morning walking around and thinking everyone else was seeing what I was wearing. It was a sick game I was playing. I felt guilt and shame and I was the one who demanded I wear those labels. No one was pinning them on me each day except myself, she says. She said, I'm guessing this might be the same for you. She talks about how uh, we pin this invisible letter on our life and we def- let it define who we think we are and we walk around with that letter as though wearing it is our job. And A for addict, C for cutter, U for ugly, D for depressed, L for loser, M for monster, W for worthless, T for terrible at everything. She says those are not who you are. And so if I were going to summarize our vision this morning in a way that really communicates, in the way that you can grab onto it, we give people a new letter to wear. That's what we do. We don't put a computer on every desk. We we don't put a smartphone in every hand. Okay? We don't put a new well in every country. These are great vision statements from from great organizations. What do we do? How do we know we've accomplished our vision? We give people a brand new letter to wear. And their life, their entire life, has a new identity. And they can live from that. And they can change. And their life can go in a new direction. Okay? We give people a new letter to wear. Maybe you need a new letter this morning. Well, what's our vision? To lead people to God's forgiveness, not manipulate, coerce, flog, or or, uh, trick them or deceive them in any way. To lead people to God's forgiveness. What's the other part of this vision thing? Okay, restored to God's purpose. Restored. And so when we we, uh, connect with others and we grow with them and whatever the venue, whether it's worship here in a service on Sunday or other times, other places, we are learning something of God's restoration plan and project. We're learning how to, we're, we're learning how to see things, how to think about things. And we're seeing stuff in our lives. We address it and we change our way of seeing and doing and parenting and marriage and personal relationships, addictions and resources and what we find after the process has run its course for a little while is that we are fundamentally changed people. And that's the process. The beauty of a life of restoration. And so when, we, when people make the same mistakes over and over again, they need someone there to love them, to accept them, to point them to Jesus. Here's something very telling, very powerful. And that is that we never see Jesus saying to someone, how could you do that? We never see Jesus in the gospel say, I am so ashamed of you. We never see Jesus saying in the gospels, who do you think you are? He never comes across that way. You see, our vision says that we value confession and repentance and honesty in a safe place over secrets and perceived perfection. And what my, the vision I would hold out to you this morning, the leadership of our church would hold out to you, is that you be the first to extend God's grace to the person who needs to lay down all of their letters 
and accept God's acceptance of them through Christ. You be the first. You lead the charge. Connect, grow, serve. To lead people to God's forgiveness and see them restored little by little such that you attend every week. Your restoration journey is going to go a lot better because you're learning new things. You're applying new things. You attend once every couple months. Restoration journey is going to go a little less expeditious. Okay, it's going to go a little slower because you're not exposing yourself to much growth. Right? So church attendance is important because it gives us opportunities to learn and grow and lean more into this new identity. That's why we, that's why we come here every week. That's why some of you are here every week. Praise God. You're here like every single week. Your restoration journey's clicking right along. Praise God. You're hearing things like this to help you think about how to do life. Well, how are we doing? You flip your bulletin over. How are we doing? How are we doing with, are we God-centered rather than celebrity-centered? Aren't you glad there's not a big billboard out on 33 with my big toothy grin? Welcome to everybody at Stone Hill Community Church. Wouldn't that be awful? I mean, I think the attendance probably just like, instead of, it would probably go, kind of go like that. That would be the attendance trajectory. Like, why, what's that church about? Why are they built around a personality, around a person? That's not how we're built. That's not how we roll. All right? It's a God-centered deal. It's His identity in us and over us and spoken to us. I'm a messenger, and I, my big job is just to teach His truth and stay the heck out of the way. Just get out of the way and let God do His work preach his truth, be faithful, and help people to see they got a brand new letter to wear. God-centered. I think we're doing okay there. People-centered, not money-centered. Oh, praise God for uh, that which is offered and the dead elimination thing. This is awesome, but we're not always just asking for more, 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 more. And instead, we think in terms of people and how it's important it is for us to be deployed to share Jesus. And I think that's probably one of the things that we probably could work on more as our church is that we learn how, how that we're being deployed each week to be Jesus in our community. And when the situation so calls for it, to share Jesus and see His new life, His new identity spoken over the lives of your friends and the people you rub shoulders with. I think we probably do better there. Family-centered, not tradition-centered. Your entire family would make an honest effort to try to minister to your whole family. Participant-centered, again, on the back of your bulletin, in your version notes. Participant-centered, not pastor-centered. You have a regular opportunity to participate, sometimes right in the service. Bible-centered, not cultural-centered. We preach the Bible, praise God. We preach the Bible. That's one of our big core values. Community-centered, not self-centered. Touching the community, whether it's Epic, Operation Foundation, other things. Touching the community. Disciple-centered, not convert-centered. Can new believers get discipled? And by the way, in the next month or so, we're going to be starting a Jesus Factor Fiction because this is our discipleship vehicle for people who are new. I've told you some of you of that. Some of you have had questions about the spiritual life and things. Wanting to follow Jesus. This is, this is a great place to ask questions. If you're brand new to the idea of being a Christian or what what it means to be a believer, what it means, this new identity means. You know, I think about concepts like this, vision and leadership and God's mercy and new identity. And I think about this, I think about Andy on the Andy Griffith show. You know what? As I think about Jesus, I think about Andy. And and sometimes we need something with visible, something we can see. And I think as a kid, I remember, you know, just watching Andy and seeing how he led people. and, And, you know, I never see Andy saying, how could you? either i never see andy saying i'm so ashamed of you barney for making another mess for me to clean up i never see andy saying who do you think you are he never comes across that way i want you to watch andy as he does this amazing thing of when barney makes a mess there's criminals that are coming to the mayberry jail okay big time crooks And they're going to put him in Mayberry in hopes that their two crook buddies are going to come and break him out. Barney thinks that they ought to really, really put on a good show for these criminals that are coming in. And so he deputizes Gomer. And he's going to try to show off to the criminals, you know. They keep escaping. Andy keeps recatching the same criminals. 
And Barney eventually captures two FBI agents and he locks those guys up thinking that they're the criminals who have come to break their buddies out. Watch how Andy handles this. Roll it.